Hello and welcome to an extra electoral dysfunction from Sky News with me, Beth Rigby. Me, Ruth Davidson. And me, Harriet Harman. Well, hello. It's Saturday afternoon and you are not dreaming because on this Saturday afternoon, it's the second episode from us this week because there's a new leader of the Tory party, the first black woman to lead a major UK party, the fourth uh, female leader of the Conservative Party, party it's kemi badenock ruth what do you think in terms of symbolism you're right uh we continue to be the party that says we don't care about that we just want the best person for the job uh so so that's the positive uh in terms of the negative um i, I have concerns i'm not gonna lie do you, do you want me to come in there I, i'm like <laughs> and continue <laughs> no no i'm just I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm going to say something now and then I'm going to come back to this because we should just say, if you haven't been closely following this very long contest, Kemi Badenot ran on a campaign of conservative values. Her slogan was renew. Unlike her opponent, Robert Jenrick, she didn't really do any policy announcements. Um, But she's always been strong on identity issues, support for businesses, and she is a politician that likes to say a lot that she's going to tell the truth. She's, if you like, plain speaking. Some might say abrasive. That's what some of her colleagues might say. Uh, But she, you know, would say that she's straight talking. She punches through. Ruth, you said that you had some concerns. Are you worried about her plain speaking, as she would put it? Well, look, part of the job of being in opposition is that you've got to throw the odd punch. But the thing is, that's only a really small part of the job. A really big part of the job is being able to go out, talk to people, listen to the electorate, the people that have just rejected you if you're in a situation like this when you've just you know, been put out of office. This idea that you woo people uh, and that you are conciliatory, that you're encouraging, that you're supportive, that you use soft skills. You know, I- I'm worried that Kemi Badenoch up until now can start a fight in an empty room, that she might feel a bit grand to do the, the kind of hard work of chasing people, of asking them. Uh, and my concern is that that actually her way of, of trying to change people's mind is to hector them and to scold them and to, to talk about people that aren't conservative enough or not true conservatives, because we've seen a bit of that in this contest and prior to this contest. And and you can't scold the country into voting for you. Small anecdote, but, you know, from a journalistic perspective, you had, what do they do after the results announced? Do they come and talk to journalists? What what do they do in terms of statements? I mean, Badenoch did a, a, a speech that was, what, six, seven minutes long. Uh, and then it was very much, she will not be taking questions at this time and, and was whisked off into a side room as I you know, valiantly chased her with a microphone as as everyone would expect me to do. She didn't um, do a huddle, not even no, for No, she didn't for do press. a huddle. And this this is what you I'm know, saying. Well, I, so, I would be delighted. If I was Ed Davey right now and I heard that, I would be delighted because all I would need to know is that I just need to make sure that my press office is phoning up journalists and making people available because if she, like, she has, she's not, no God given right to be covered, particularly out of an election cycle. There's no broadcasting rules that say you've got to cover the opposition. When you're in opposition, you have to work bloody hard to get coverage. And if she's not willing to do it, then, you know, the, the, the party's in a bit of trouble if it's trying to come back. Harriet, what do you think Keir Starmer is going to be thinking about this. He's now going to have to go up against her a lot. Uh, He tweeted uh, shortly after her election. He said this, the first black leader of a Westminster party is a proud moment for our country. I look forward to working with you and your party in the interests of the British people. Can you see them working together, Harriet? Well, I think that's exactly the right tone. I mean, I think that he will not be wanting to be patronising or condescending or triumphalist because that will just really turn people off. And at the end of the day, she is the leader of the opposition. She has got a big role in politics in this country. And I think being respectful and taking her seriously is exactly the right thing to do. Do you think he'll be pleased with this result? How would you rank Kemi Badenoch as a threat to Labour? Well, I think that it's absolutely 
too early to say, obviously, it'll be how she does it. But I think it's hard to underestimate the scale of the tasks that she has. She will have inherited a shell. You know, the party staff will have all been on temporary contracts up to the date of the election. Uh, you, all the equipment that would have been hired in for the election would have gone. The money would have been used up. She's got hardly any MPs. And the first thing she'll have to do is send emails to all the people who lost and say, you know, I'm the new leader and I just want to thank you for your public service um, and sorry you've lost. And she'll be needing to find candidates for the first big test, which is the May County Council elections. And the first struggle will be to find enough candidates to cover all the seats that are up for election, let alone get the campaigning going so that she can start finding her way back, the Tories, for the Tories. I think there's an earlier problem. I, I honestly think there's an earlier problem. and I, I wonder whether she'll be able to fill every front bench seat. I don't think she will. I don't think she will. I think I don't people think she will, will have to dug her up. Because if you look at it, there's 121 Tory MPs. You've got some who are select committee members, deputy speakers, some who rule themselves out, like Rishi, uh, Rishi Sunak and James Cleverley. And actually, you've got to have 108 ministerial posts. So people will have to double up. But actually, Labour will have inadvertently helped her with this because we've tightened the rules on outside jobs. So a lot of MPs won't have the earning opportunities that they might have had hitherto. So they might as well go on the front bench. Ruth, though, it's it's interesting because I was talking to a couple of um, people that you would say weren't massively her supporters. Uh, And one of them said to me um, that they thought she might struggle to get all six of the candidates who ran in the election to to sit in her shadow cabinet. I mean, James Cleverley's ruled himself out, um, but apparently there is one or two others that really do don't rub up well against uh, Kemi Badenoch and and might not want to go in. And she was going to have a question as well about does she want to cajole them in for the sake of party unity, always on the risk that they, like, you know, if you get on with somebody or don't get on with somebody, always at the risk that they then resign at some future point because they don't like what you're doing or when you get into trouble, they don't stick with you. Uh, and, and it becomes a, a troublesome or difficult issue. Or would it be better that you offer and get turned down and it looks like a snub, snub but it looks like you've been the bigger person here? Uh, so there's there's a lot to to, to tee up. And, and this is why Harriet and I were talking before you joined us, uh, Beth, and we were chatting about there was this internet rumour that the candidates found out on Thursday night and I was like there's absolutely no way one because nobody in the Tory party can keep a secret so it's it's absolutely not true but two because there would be a huge amount of activity to try and get this going because I mean it could take days for her to fill posts and also there's going to be a lot of people out there who are looking at the shell of a party Uh, there's only 120 other MPs as they look around Tory MPs and they think that they should be the shadow foreign secretary there'll be about 15 people that think this should be part of the you know the big four shadow jobs and you know and she's not going to be able to give that to them so why would you if you think that you're going to get one of these really big jobs why would you settle for the deputy paper clips minister of course you won't so I, I mean I genuinely think she's got a problem it's not just that either Ruth she also had only a third of I mean <laughs> Only a third of Conservative MPs actually backed Kemi Badenoch. I mean, it was it was split three ways between Jenrick, Cleverly, and uh, Kemi Badenoch. Um, so already MPs are messaging me and and former party uh, or former MPs messaging saying, you know, there's a really big job she's got here to even get the parliamentary party behind her. Interestingly, the 22 committee, and that's this committee of backbenchers that sort of set the rules, uh, they changed um, the threshold at which uh, you can trigger a no confidence vote. Uh, They did that last week. It emerged today. Um, and they've changed it from 15% of MPs to 33% of MPs. And that basically means that to call a confidence vote in Badenoch, uh, you'd have to have 40 MPs uh, to do that. So a third of the parliamentary party against what, 15 to 17? I haven't done the maths off the top of my head. When you talk about shell of a party, I mean, I, I did the numbers. And if my maths is right, and, and I'm, I'm not a mathlete by any cha- um, stretch of the imagination, but the membership of the Tory party is now 0.19% of the population of this country. So it's a fifth of 1%. You know, it's, it is a tiny, vanishingly small number of people. Um, and if she's not got, you know, a, a large cohort of MPs that are backing her, if she's not got a large cohort of 
members that, that couldn't get out of vote. And, 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 you know, I, I we've talked about how conflicted I was. And, and it was only because I've never not voted in any ballot that I've had the right to vote in. I've never, ever spoiled a ballot paper. I've never, ever not voted that I felt that I had to. I would quite happily have just given this one a pass. And I noticed that other Cameroons, Nikki Morgan, the former education minister, Ed Vasey, the former culture minister, both of them said that they couldn't cast a ballot in this. So the enthusiasm within the Tory party, it isn't really there. So if she's not going to reach out, like it is incumbent on the leader to reach out to others and to sceptics. And, you know, I, I, I am worried. I really am. So interesting, Ruth. Let's just go through the numbers because it looks like 40,000 members didn't vote at all. Um, and then... Badenoch got just over 53,000 votes to Jenrick's 41,000. Turnout was down on 22. In fact, I think it might have been the lowest turnout ever. And she won by the narrowest margin ever by what my early calculations uh, show. The 53,000 that she got to win was a smaller number than the 60,000 Rishi Sunak clocked up in 2022 when he lost to Liz Truss. This is not an emphatic win. She doesn't have it. She doesn't have a huge mandate, does she? I actually don't think she's going to struggle for a mandate. I I think that people within the Tory Party, even people that that maybe particularly are not of her tribe within the Tory Party, will think that look, it was a fair election. It was conducted in the right manner. Um, it lasted a long time. People were tested. There was plenty of rounds, and, and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, uh, but the second half of that is, and now what is she going to do with it? People believe that she's won it fair and square. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be recriminations. I don't think there's going to be moves to unsettle her. I think, I think there is a passing of the ball that says, right, you've got the ball. Right, what are you going to do with it now? Uh, and I think that, um, you know, she's got, she's got these uh, electoral tests in, in May. If they're terrible, she won't be judged on that. I would guess that if she doesn't give us a big uptick in performance uh, and in hope and in all of the things that you measure on the way into uh, an election. She's probably got between two and three years. I, I don't think she'll be unseated within the first two years. I think we're sick of the upheaval that we've had in terms of the number of leaders. Um, she'll be given at least two years to prove herself. But if she doesn't prove herself and we're halfway through a parliamentary term, then, you know, we need to see we need to see a big performance. And, and this is a Labour Party that is there for the taking. You know, we can we can take chunks out of their their majority. We really can. I'm not saying we can overturn it in a term, but we really can be looking at the next general election to winning back lots of seats that were won by a small margin. So we've got to have that belief. But I, I reckon she'll get two years. I don't think she'll be un, unseated or undermined very early on. OK, two, two years, Harriet. I'm going to I want to ask you about the tone of her speech. But before I do, I just on that, someone did say to me today, uh, a conservative operative, did say to me that they could see a world in which if Kemi Badenoch is struggling two and a half, three years in, um, it might be an opportunity for Keir Starmer to call a slightly earlier election um, when you've got a kind of leader on the ropes. It's, could you see that as part of a calculation for Starmer? Well, I think people would be very disapproving of that because I think that general elections are for calling when they're absolutely necessary in the interests of the country, not just because you think you can take political advantage. So I don't see him doing that. You know, we can't assume that the election's five years out. He might decide to call an election after four years, not five. When you get into that margin, who knows? But I think that if people think that he's seeing that the Conservatives are in difficulty and therefore he'll take a dash for getting another election. Why would he do that? He's got a very big majority. You know, he's got five years. He's got plans that need to be uh, implemented. So I can't see I can't see that happening. Ruth, just quickly, Kemi Badenoch supporters were saying to me they 100% think that she will lead the party into the next general election. What odds would you put on it? Because you're much more circumspect. Put a figure on it. 35%, 40%. You know, she's got every opportunity to start the rebuilding. But there are things that you really have to do when you're in opposition. And and part of that is you've got to put in the legwork. You've got to be humble. You don't just stand up there and, and then try and scold them into submission and become conservatives. And, and I have yet to see any evidence that that is going to be her approach. I mean, Harriet, you were there when Keir Starmer won the leadership. He talked a lot about 
looking at the election of 2019, working out what had gone wrong. How did he rebuild the party? Then how did he get the electorate to give him a hearing is how he used to describe it and then build a policy platform by which they could potentially win an election and they did go on to win that election. Kemi Badenoch today in this speech, and I have to say it was extremely short, it was but a few minutes uh, long. Uh, She's not talked about policy at all really in this race, but she did uh, call out the last government. She said they let standards slip. She said it was time to tell the truth and it was time to rethink conservatism. What did you make of that speech? Do you think that that's an important part of the rebuilding for the Conservative Party in with the public to acknowledge uh, standard slips when mistakes were made? Well, I think Keir Starmer had three phases. The first was to recognise the problems in the party and change the party. The second was to expose the fact that the Tories were not doing a good job in government. And the third was to show that we were we had an alternative for the future of this country. So he had three phases that he took us through. And the first one, which was a substantial period of time, was a profound critique of where the party had been under Jeremy Corbyn with impractical policies, riven with factionalism and anti-Semitism. So he spent quite a lot of time on that. I was I thought she did a good acceptance speech. I thought it was gracious, it was purposeful. And I was quite surprised when she said, not only, you know, we've got to be honest that there've been mistakes, but she said, we let standards slip. And I was quite struck by that because she hasn't she hasn't said anything like that before. What does she mean by that? Is she is she referring to Boris Johnson and what was going on. Um, So I think that we'll be interested to see how that plays out. And, you know, if you ever get to interview her, Beth, I'll be interested if you could ask her what she means by letting standards slip. I'd like to hear more about that. But, you know, as as Ruth said, it's all to play for for her. And the, the Tories having had so much instability with five leaders in the last eight years. They will be wanting stability. They will be wanting her to succeed. So really, it's in her hands. It's not impossible that she can, you know, leap out from, you know, her inglorious period in government and become a better leader of the opposition than we anticipate her to be. But I think it would be a mistake to underestimate her. And she, as a politician... um is not that well known. I mean, she came into Parliament seven years ago. She is Nigerian uh, by descent. She was born in the UK, what, in 1980. So she's in her mid-40s, spent a lot of her childhood in Nigeria. She's effectively a, a libertarian who thinks the British state, in her words, is broken. Uh, she wants smaller government. She wants radical new ideas. Do you think that she's going to have a job, Harriet, whereby she needs to try and show the public who she is and, you know, just try and get an audience with the electorate? I don't know whether that means doing slightly softer interview profiles or documentaries or behind the scenes at her house. But do you you think she has a job there to try and just introduce herself to the public. I mean, you know, Keir Starmer had been leader of the Labour Party for three years before the general election. I remember going up uh, to constituencies and he would be there. I'd be like, do you know who that bloke is? And everyone would be like, haven't got a clue. Who is he? It's really hard just to be uh, recognised. Is she going to have to do a bit of work on that and and, and sort of hammer home who Kemi Badenoch is? What everybody's interested in right now is what's going to happen to the health service in their local area. And that's depending not on Kemi Badenoch or anybody in the Conservative Party. It's depending on Wes Streeting and Labour ministers. So that's where the focus will be. Same on the economy. And it's hard to overstate how irrelevant in a way, not only the people, but what they say are when you're in opposition, because they're just people talking she she will need to try and get public attention for the arguments that, that she wants to make. But the temptation will be to say things that are outrageous in order to get some coverage. And if she does that, then she will undermine herself. 
But one of the frustrations of opposition when you've got a big majority, and I know it so well, is you can be like making a genius speech, an incontrovertibly true, insightful point, and nobody is listening. And I don't know how she's going to cope with that. But at the moment, she's got to sort out the party, the finances, the organisation, the future candidates, what's going on in the parliamentary Tory party, sorting out her front bench. She's got to do all of that domestic kind of housework first um, before she gets even half a chance to be listened to publicly because people want to know what's going to happen in their lives. And she right now is not relevant for that. I think she's more recognisable than Starmer, though. I mean, you put him in a lineup when he was first elected and he looked like a lot of other... Well, actually, I think he looks very young for his age. So he looked like a lot of other 50s white men that could live on your street. Um, whereas actually, I, I think, one, she's got flawless skin, so she looks she looks young. She looks younger than her age. I, I think, you know, as well as being black and a woman, she also dresses, I think, quite young. Um, not inappropriately, but I think, I think you look at her and she looks like a... A fresher face, so I think that people will. If you you get the you know the the street tests where they have a bit of a picture of you know who is Kemi Bade knock out of this, I think people will recognise her. Whether they whether that translates into knowing about her, feeling warmth towards her, liking what her message is, that's very different. Because at the moment she's behaving like she's still a cabinet minister with a massive portfolio, uh, and everyone wants a piece of her because she's got this quite uh, material uh, impact of decision making that affects uh, tax and spend and government and, and decision making at the heart of government. That's kind of the way she's still mentally operating. Um, but that's not a reality for, for where they are. And I, I'm really interested to see how they uh, transition now and whether her approach changes. Ruth, I don't think it will actually. I don't think the approach is going to change. No, I don't think it will. I think that leaves space though for other people that are shadow ministers. So if I was looking at who she might be able to get to serve in a shadow cabinet, um, you've already seen James cleverly count himself out. Now, if there's another leadership election before a general election, um, or where it looks like the next leader might be in the running to become the next prime minister, or at least challenge for it, he's already done some big jobs. He doesn't need that. But I'd, I'd keep your money and I'd keep your eyes on Tom Tugendhat because one of the criticisms in this, even though he had a really good momentum, he picked up a lot more votes than people thought he did. I thought he came out of it with some credibility. One of the arguments was he hadn't done a big job. Um, he had attended cabinet. He'd never been a cabinet minister. So I would expect him to hold out for something like defence or foreign affairs so that if, you know, were she to fall, he could run again. And this time he's done something big and he's and, and her not courting the media creates space for others in her cabinet team. Well, look, we are going to be talking about Kemi Badenoch. I might even get to interview her. We might even get her on the pod. You never know. Actually, we should get her on the pod. Kemi Badenoch, if you're listening to this, and I know you're not because you already told us at party conference you hate political podcasts. But do uh, if one of your team are, get Kemi to come on be good. Anyway, we'd love to get your takes on all of this too. So remember, you can always send us a voice note. Just send it to us on WhatsApp to the burner phone 07934 200 or email us at electoraldysfunction at sky.uk. And Harriet and Ruth, thank you for doing this emergency Saturday special. I feel what? like we're football commentators, you know, except <laughs> yeah. we're doing politics. How did Arsenal go- do today? They just got they beat lost. 1-0, didn't they? They lost. Yeah. Yes, that was that was bad news for me. But anyway, I will go and commiserate with myself. Kemi Badenoch is celebrating. Robert Jemrick will be gutted, but that's politics, ladies, isn't it? Now, go and enjoy your Saturday nights. Good night. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.